The next time I remember seeing Quincy was in Birdland after I had moved to New York in 1961. I went to New York January 18th of 1961. And sometime during the, the year 1961, you know, because Birdland was the home, the mecca for, for jazz, modern jazz in particular. Um, and I was always going down to Birdland to see what was happening. You know, Birdland was located on uh, 52nd and Broadway. And um, one time I went down, and usually they had two groups. There would be an opening act and then the headlining group. And uh, Quincy Jones w was there. So I had to see Quincy with his big band. I wanted to hear Stockholm Sweetening live, you know? And um, I got to meet him during that time. So here we are, 40 years later. <laughs> I've known this guy for 40 years. You know? Just imagine me being 21 years old, being, having total tunnel vision about, about jazz, except for, for classical music. You know, I liked classical music and jazz, and that was it. I mean, that was my world, you know, the world that I was just kind of peeking into from a professional standpoint, from a musician's standpoint, um, professionally. Um, so for me, Birdland was heaven. <laughs> I mean, to play in Birdland was a big deal. That would be like playing Carnegie Hall. T to see anybody at Birdland uh, or to work at Birdland means that you've really arrived on the jazz scene. And the jazz scene in the 60s was hot. It was innovative. It was in clubs, still primarily. Um, there weren't a lot of um, big concert venues where they had, had uh, jazz concerts. The Newport Jazz Festival was alive and well. That had started, I think, in the late 50s. Um, but um, jazz was really hot in the clubs. Clubs were always packed, full of hip people coming to see jazz, people in their 20s, people in their their 30s, you know, some teenagers. That was really the hot music, you know. Um, in 61, rock and roll was in its infancy. You know, this was pre-Beatles, uh, as far as America was concerned anyway, uh, pre um, the Rolling Stones. So um, anyway, I didn't care about that anyway. <laughs> I wasn't even interested in that. I wasn't interested in Elvis. I, you know, that was a whole other scene. I cared about, you know, Miles Davis. I cared about, uh, you know, John Coltrane, Bill Evans, and Quincy Jones. You know, that was, those were my my heroes at that time. And so I got a chance to to see you, the young Quincy Jones, but he was older than me. See, <laughs> uh, Quincy had this great reputation of being one of the the young lions, you know, uh, as far as the big band scene was concerned. Um, along with, you know, uh, Lee Morgan on trumpet, uh, Freddie Hubbard on trumpet, um, and Miles Davis, and all, all these, these were, were like the, the top people at the time. And of course, Dizzy Gillespie was still around, and Dizzy had a great, a great big band. Count Basie had a great big band. But Quincy had some new kinds of arrangements, new harmonies, a new perception of the use of a big band. And, and that made him uh, extremely exciting to a young person like me. In, in the early 60s, um, uh, all of a sudden, we began to see Quincy's name in another context. He becomes uh, the head, he becomes an executive with a major record company, Mercury Records. He was the head of A&R. Now, he was the first black record executive of a major company. You know, it looks ludicrous today to think, what, they didn't have anybody else before with major companies? But that's the way it was, you know, once he was really the first. So he really broke ground as far as race relations were concerned, um, as far as the kind of, the, let's say, the color of the business side of, of music. You know, they had a lot of black artists, 
But when it came to the people who actually own the labels and who control the music, the black people were not in, in, in control of that. You know, Again, we were like hired hands. But Quincy became the first, so he opened a, a doorway. And, and as an African American, I mean, we all recognize that, you know, that here's a guy that's a, a real pioneer from not just the music scene, but from a, a political and social scene, you know, and that was a very important step that, that he made uh, in order to open, open a hold the doorway for the future. One of the, one of the things, uh, one of the big records, probably maybe the biggest record that, that Quincy had at that time, certainly one of the biggest ones, was um, Leslie Gore, right? Um, it's my party, you know. Uh, that was a huge record at that time. Uh, it was kind of, I don't know, bubblegum pop or something. I don't know exactly what it was, but it was, it was a big hit record uh, by this black record executive um, who was one of our heroes. You know? And um, as far as the musicians were concerned, to, to my recollection, nobody, we didn't even care that it was Leslie Go or a whole other genre of music, you know, that wasn't, it, it, that wasn't a, an issue for us to quibble about. That was small potatoes. I mean, we were, we were just happy that we finally got one of our guys in that end of the music business, you know. It was the beginning of, of something that was very important as far as we were concerned. And so if, if Quincy is successful, it's better not only for African-American musicians, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and it's also better for the music scene, and it's better for America. Yeah, <laughs> you know, this is a country that, that um, um, has in its population uh, ties connecting us with every country and every race on the planet, but uh, that it wasn't represented so well in, in business back in those days. You know, of course, it's changed a lot since then, but there's still a lot of, <laughs> there's a long way to go, though. <laughs> Quincy's sound, if you want to call it, is more like that of a, a chameleon. You know, he's able to change colors, uh, 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 timbres, you know, tone quality at will. Um, he can work as easily with uh, a Michael Jackson as he could with, uh, with Snoop Doggy Dog, you know, or with uh, um, Barbara Streisand, Frank Sinatra, uh, movie scores, you know, you name it, Quincy's done it. He's been able to take this genius of his and translate it into um, any kind of sound that he chooses, any kind of direction that he chooses. I think the core of Quincy's sound comes from his lust for life, you know, and his um, feeling that, that any genre is equally valid. And his um, curiosity about how he can find a place in any of the genres. You know, he's fearless as far as that's concerned. He doesn't, he's not the kind of guy that says, no, I can't do that. You know, if you want Quincy to do something, you tell him that he can't do it. And of course he will, he'll do it. <laughs> he's that kind of guy. So, so he's got that kind of flexibility. One of, the, one of the great reasons why I admire Quincy Jones is because of his unbelievable talent for doing movie scores. You know, some of the most beautiful music for scores was done by Quincy Jones. And, he, and um, I mean, he's done, you know, dozens. No, he's done scores of music, sc of movie scores, right? And uh, uh, he's well established in that industry. Um, he, he helped carve out the modern concept of, of, of movie scoring. Uh, 
as a matter of fact, in that, that industry. And um, um, what a lot of people don't know is that um, I've done about maybe 10 movie scores myself. Um, the first one I did in 1966, it was called Blow Up. And that was because Michelangelo Antonioni, the director, was a big jazz fan and he, and he, he actually knew my music. The second one um, uh, was called A Spook Who Sat By The Door. By Ivan Dixon was the director. Um, Ivan Dixon was an actor that was on Hogan's Heroes, the black actor that was on, on that. But he, was also, he did also directed a few movies and he knew my music. Then after that, I did a movie called Death Wish. You know? um, and that was uh, followed by, I, I did Soldier Story, I did um, 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 Harlem Nights, uh, um, Eddie Murphy's film, I did Round Midnight. But the, the point I want to bring up is that from that third film on, uh, it was really Quincy Jones that made it possible for me to get my foot in the door of the film scoring business, you know, because uh, either he would suggest me or directors would call him and say, hey Q, what about this guy Herbie Hancock, you know, what, what's, what do you think? And Quincy would always give me an, an A rating uh, and uh, reassure them that uh, they made a, they would be making the right choice by choosing me, and, and I will always be eternally grateful to Quincy Jones for, because of his compassion for providing that doorway for me to, to enter this, this wonderful field. There's this amazing footage of you and Quincy in the early 80s, looking at early synthesizer technology. <laughs> <laughs> One time, I got this call from um, a guy who was um, representing a company called Fairlight. And he had this new digital instrument that had, that was a, a, had a computer built into it. There was a keyboard. It had a touch screen, which nobody even heard of back in those days. This was, uh, um, this was in the 80s. And um, I guess maybe mid 80s. Um, touch screen, you could draw waveforms on it. I mean, it had these things that, it, you know, I hadn't even dreamed about stuff like this, and I'm into technology. You know, you know, I was I was an engineering major for my first two years of college, so I'm like into that kind of thing. Um, so he called me up, and it was an Australian company. Anyway, um, he was coming to Los Angeles to show it to Stevie Wonder. Now, I said to this guy, "You got to show this to me. For, you got to show it to me. I got to see it." You know. Well, I knew that Quincy Jones was also interested in new things, you know. He didn't want to be left out of the, uh, out of the loop, you know. So I called him up and I called up a guy named Jordy Hormel who uh, owned a recording studio, um, uh, West LA Music. So I called both of them over and I, I said, look, this guy's coming over to demonstrate this instrument. Anyway, they both came to see it um, and when the day was done, Quincy was blown away by this, this fair light. But he didn't want to commit himself to buying one right then. You know, he wanted to, you know, check it out and kind of have it marinate in his head, you know, figure it out for a minute. Jordy Hormel, in the meantime, pulled out uh, enough money to buy two of these things, you know. And they were expensive at the time. You know, they were $25,000 a piece, which was um, a lot of money for anything back in, in those days. You know, and, and Jordy pulls out 50 grand, 
to pay this guy. And the guy said, no, I can't do this. But, but Quincy kind of took his time. You know, I don't, I don't know if he, I don't think he ever really bought one, but he used it. Uh, I think he used it in some TV shows. Uh, maybe he used it in Ironsides. Um, I don't know. I'd have to find out from him, you know, exactly how he used it. But, but Q was like that. He wanted to know. He said, anything, anytime anything new comes out, give me a call, you know. So uh, he's got that kind of basic curiosity, you know.